Hello and welcome to another episode of Mastering Dungeons. I'm Sean Merwin and Teos is having some weather related issues. So we're hoping that he's warm, dry and well fed. And in the meantime, I have Mike, Shay, Sly Flourish himself here to do the news and do some answers to questions. Mike, thank you for being on the show. Oh, it's always my pleasure. You know, I love being here. What's new with you? Uh, I just, like, not, you know, a half hour before the show, sent the final Kickstarter update for Forge of Foes. So, Teos and Scott Fitzgerald Gray and I had worked on a project all last year called Forge of Foes, uh, where you can build awesome, build and run awesome 5e monsters for, for your game. We launched the Kickstarter last March, I think it was, and we finally, we delivered all of the products, print and digital, uh, by now and sent out our final update saying we are officially done. So, of course, there's always hmm. last minute things. Hey, I didn't get my email. Hey, the backer kit thing didn't go. Hey, our package got lost in the mail. Hey, I got in its damage. There's always like Kickstarters never end, mm -hmm. really. I'm still right. answering. I'm still fulfilling stuff from my like <laughs> Kickstarters like five years ago. But the bulk of it is done and we are super excited. We love the product. It, awesome. You know, I, I just it, it's it's egotistical. But like when you open it up your own, I don't know if do you feel this way when you open up your books, but like I open it up and I'm just I'm so proud of the work we did there. It's really, really great. I I have my copy right here. Oh, look at you. Uh, Bless you. Keep it. Keep it. Keep it close. Bless you, uh, my friend. So how long was it from, you know, the actual Kickstarter launch to to now? It wasn't that long. No. So it's less than a year. Uh, yeah. It's March to January. Right. Uh, we had okay. we had hoped we, we almost got it all done in. 2023 but we literally had like we were just following a shipping container moving its way across the ocean super slow and then there was like a lot of last minute paperwork and then our european distributor uh had a bunch of kickstarters that they were fulfilling at the same time yeah. and we got you had to go wait in line there so it ended mm -hmm. up being we had about two months of sort of downtime while we were waiting for that but like nor all north american about 80 percent of the kickstarter a little, a little bit more about 90 percent was fulfilled in by october or yeah. I guess, yeah, October, early November. And then the remaining 20%, which was all of our physical non-North American deliveries happened in uh, late December and early January. Amazing. That's great. Yeah. And the whole you, project. You I run a tight ship there at Sly Flourish Publishing. Well, we, you know, it, so, I mean, this is, it's interesting because like I, I, I'm, I'm in businesses I don't want to be in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but now I've got it kind of, the paths are smoothed out. So like, do I really... Like now I have relationships with book printers and now I have a relationship with distributors and, and we have this sort of workflow already set. It's like, would we want to have, or like, I would love to have someone else do it, but now we have it. So why yeah. wouldn't we use it? Well, you have it until next time when some other thing comes up. Right. Uh, yeah, or, but like entire companies would have to go out of business before it would shake up the whole thing. Well, that thing, never right? happens. Like, <laughs> well, big business, you know, big business is bigger than us, right? right like gotcha. Friesen's in Canada is huge. <laughs> like right, it was, yeah, they've true. been the printer. They print National Geographic. Yeah. So, you know, they're, 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 they would, you know, big changes. I mean, small ones could absolutely occur. Um, but yeah, so there's that weird thing of like, we've got it wired now. And I, I'm, you know, about half of what we do, what I do, what my, my wife and I do are things that like, isn't really what I want to be doing, but like, uh -huh. well, We've, we're now in the spot and it's easier for us to do it than to try to transfer it or we would end up having to pay a lot of money yeah. to have someone else do the things that we already have wired, right? Yeah. So that's kind of a strange spot to be in. But yeah, we're super happy with it. Yeah, yeah. and it, the project took longer than that because we were working on it for months before we launched the Kickstarter. I think yeah. we started it like mid-2022 or something like that when we started writing a lot of it. Yeah, I always feel bad when there's a Kickstarter I'm involved in. I don't run them myself because I don't even want to get anywhere near that madness. Yeah, well, but if yeah. there's one I'm involved in and it's like even a couple months late, I feel really bad. And then I will get a message from a Kickstarter I backed four years ago yeah. saying, and you're like, oh, we're so sorry yeah. for being late. I was like, wait, there's, I feel bad yeah. about a two month delay when right. I've got we four had, years. We had people we had people that were like kind of angry with us because of delays in other people's Kickstarters. And they were like, hey, I got hosed on this other one. You better be on. And where are you right now? And how come, you know, and I'm like, man, we're fine. Right? <laughs> like, you know, we're in a different spot. Yeah. So we get all kinds, right? Like there's definitely people where they, they just, I mean, there's, it, it, we don't really talk about it, but there's just a percentage of people who back it and never get any product and paid the money and they never contact you again. And it's, mm. it's not small. It's like two or 3%. Mm. 
Mm. You know, and, and you know, like I want to give them stuff. Like it's not like we're happy <laughs> that they gave us free money, especially PDFs, right? It cost me right. nothing to give them a PDF. And yeah, lots of people just never get it, and it's sad because like you know you want you want to give it to them. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's really it's very interesting, you know, running it. And now I think this is like my seventh or eighth Kickstarter, and you know, you're still learning stuff from new ones. And my my wife now has retired from her day job and is now uh, kind of working you know mostly full-time like we're gonna significant amount of hours a week i'll tell you yeah. uh handling a lot of this stuff and it's really interesting for us together to kind of noodle through how this whole thing works and what we can do and streamlining it and all that stuff so that's really fascinating well you've been doing it for long enough lord knows uh you've got the sly flourish media empire uh <laughs> up and running between streams and podcasts and your blogs and and now you know all the books that you've published so that's uh it's, yeah, it's great. It's great that you can keep I'm, it going. I'm very lucky. Yeah. 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 Very, very, very lucky. I'm very happy with how things have been going. And, and as I thank, sit here. Thank you for asking how things oh, are going. Oh, <laughs> sure, sure. Well, as, as I sit here and, you know, think about the industry and its ups and downs and what it's going through. And I've been getting message after message from people who have been in the industry for years. And not just RPG industry, but gone between RPGs and video games. And they've been laid off. Yeah. It, you know, the numbers are are insane um yeah. the number of people who've been laid off in the entertainment field and so you know living through the tough times and making it through to the to the times where we get an, an uptick in uh in the industry is is tough so yeah, yeah. hats off yeah. to you if i could take this hat off yeah no don't <laughs> do it you'll screw up your headphones and I, I know we don't want that well mike since you're here why don't we take some of our listener emails and see if you have any uh, thing. You don't have to be Teos. You can. I'm going to uh, try to channel Teos as much as possible. I yeah. want to hear that the the, the Mike the Mike okay. Shea take. Okay. Um, Teos, although the, I'm sorry. Yeah, there you go. The, the 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 first message we got though is actually from answering something Teos said. So here we go. This is from Wireless TKD via YouTube. Uh, Teos said something in the last episode disappointment is part of the fun because it's downstroke it's the downstroke of the fun cycle this is a great point i struggle with this a lot as a dm because i realize that disappointment hits so hard for so many of my players i don't know if it's 5e or ttrpgs in general but i find that as a dm i'm always working really hard to manage those downbeats for my players so this so this brings me to the challenge. How do you make downbeats in combat fun? Or is that a complete paradox? Uh, what do you think, Mike? As a... Oh, that's a good question. And there's a lot of thoughts here. Uh, a couple of things that kind of leap to mind is one, this is where it's like we could talk about it at a high level and talk about game theory and game design overall and like game, you know, game design and actual specific products. But then like you're a DM at your table running a game for the people in front of you, mm -hmm. which is a small, finite number of people. And those specific people have different feelings about this kind of thing. Right. Uh, I, I have been running in parallel to each other a 5e very story focused, high character development, char you know, big, big, powerful characters. Uh, game in my Empire of the Ghouls game, uh, 5e, 5e game. And I've been running a Shadow Dark RPG game on Sundays. And in my Shadow Dark game, characters are dying left and right. We now have a tally. I killed my 13th character. Um, mm -hmm. on, and I have a tally, including all of their deaths. And the players there, the deaths are not really... They're, they're, they don't want to die. But it's not really a disappointment, right? So when... Right. I, ha I asked a character, like one of the players, they they they, they act, uh, attacked a mummy. The mummy killed, whatever, knocked one of the characters to zero. And then with their second attack, just curb stomped them, right? Just mm -hmm. des destroyed them. Their name was Skull, which was, the name of the character was Skull, which was very fitting, given <laughs> that their Skull. Given how they, how they passed. Crushed yeah. underfoot. Yeah. And then I said, like, what goes through your mind, right before the foot of the mummy goes through it, what goes through your mind? And, and they said, at least I died in this bitch in armor. Right. And like that was their 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 final thing was like, at least I got an awesome suit of armor to die in. Yeah. And so they just were on board with it. But I know I have players in my other group who would not be on board with that. They, they would hang on to the disappointment aspect of feeling like you lost, feeling mm -hmm. like you you failed because of like, oh, I rolled a seven instead of a three. Yeah. Right. Which is not not really a, a, a playable thing. 
So knowing what your players want feels yeah. very important to me. Knowing what how your players handle, like what counts as disappointment to them is something worth exploring for the specific players you have in front of you. Right. Uh, for, for 5e, I will offer something which I talked about on another show too and, and other people have talked about, which is specifically on the idea of like having players who roll dice and they roll their attack and they miss and then it's like 20 minutes before it's their next turn because you got a lot of players at the table and maybe you're higher level. And so like when you miss on your big thing, it sucks because like you just didn't do the thing and now you got to wait another 20 minutes for another chance to do the thing again. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I've added to my game is the luck system from uh, Black Flag, Kobo mm -hmm. Press's Black Flag, which is the engine that sits behind uh, Tales of the Valiant. And yeah. they replaced inspiration with luck. And the cool bit about luck is that when you fail an attack roll, you get a luck point, which you can then either use to increase uh, uh, another d20 roll, or if you get three of them, you can reroll. And it's a pretty minor effect, right? It, it takes three of those before you can actually reroll a die. But I have seen players who say, oh, well, at least I got a luck point, right? And mm -hmm. it's just enough of a, of a positive spin on a big negative thing that they, right. they have a little thing that they're like, well, I, I, I know I'm better off next time. It's sort of like reverse momentum of the, of the movement. Yeah. And that just that slight shift uh, has really made my own 5e games better. I've now been running it for, I think, I mean, since it came out, really. I'm like, hey, let's try this out. So at least six months in multiple 5e games. And I haven't had anybody that didn't like it. And boy, as a DM, I love it because they manage it themselves. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about distributing inspiration. Yeah. They're getting luck just by rolling crappy rolls. Yeah. And I think Wizards, in one of the, in the, I don't know where it stands in the current 5e um, uh, 2024 playtests, the D&D 2024 playtest, but they were toying with getting inspiration on a 20 or on a 1. Right. And I always felt like, oh, you should definitely do it on a 1. Right. Because now it's... You already, like, you already like, feel good on the 20. You don't need the yeah, extra. Yeah, you already feel good yeah. on the 20. You don't need something yeah. else. Now, the problem is like rolling a 1 and missing. It, you know, you're going to miss far more often than you're going to roll a 1. So it's going to be a yeah. while before you have to really fail. And that's why I think the luck works because it's it's not as much as inspiration. Right. Uh, but you get it anytime you fail at roll. So those are those are things that I like. But I think the general thing is like really think about your players and what they like and then yeah. you know, see what you can do to, in, 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 in how you run your game and the mechanics of what you run in your game to try to minimize um, the, 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 the bad disappointment. If, right. you know, on the assumption there is a good disappointment. And, and that, that's the thing, right? I want to get rid of the term disappointment altogether because disappointment in, in its very definition has that negative connotation, yeah, right? right? It's like right. the question, would you rather be lucky or good? I would rather be yeah. lucky <laughs> because <both>. lucky <laughs> implies the fact that there was a success somewhere, whereas right. good implies you are good at something, but not great, so you probably did not succeed. Um, and it's right. like that. So I don't want to use the word disappointment. It's loaded. I want to use the term like success, failure, or upbeat, downbeat, because that now when you're talking about game design, these are some things that you can really latch on to and you can look at discreetly for how the game presents them. Because if you're a game designer, you're not designing for that group of six people there. You're designing for the entire audience that might watch your game. So at that point, you need to be able to look at things and say, how does this game handle success or failure? How does it handle upbeats and downbeats? And then you have to look at it in terms of the mechanics of the game, right? The dice that you roll, the cards that you draw, and what they give to the game, and the narrative side of things. Uh, right. Because the game may have one sense of what it wants to do with, with this success or failure. Narratives are a completely different thing, right? The stories yeah. that we watch, we want there to be tension. We want there to be a question, will they or won't they succeed? Whereas in a game, the, the mechanical side of it, it might be completely antithetical to what we want in stories, or it may coincide completely. So right, right. In, in that sense, we want to think about tension. We want to think about what does success or failure mean? So when we get to the question of how do you make downbeats fun in combat, my answer is have it mean something other than just you failed. Right. Now, that might be narrative, right? You might describe it in a way that's funny or tense, that's entertaining to yourself, to the other players, and to the person who failed. Uh, right. Or if you change the 
the the static nature of what's happening. So not only did you fail, but now there's this wrinkle that I can add to the game. And right. it does 5e doesn't do that naturally. So you sort of have to step out to to do that. But other games do do so, right? The some of the powered by the apocalypse games where it succeed with a consequence. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and then uh, so you can start looking at those sorts of designs. I would suggest you read the the book Hamlet's Hit Points by Robin Laws, yep. Yep. Uh, because yeah. he talks about story beats, n both in terms of narrative and in terms of gameplay, and yeah. that can help you at least get into the mindset of. Okay, this is what it means to have tension and have success and then have failure or yeah. have the threat of success or failure and make that a, an important part of your story and an important part of your game. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and a downward beat can be something like a hard battle where you burned a lot of resources, but we're still right. successful. Right. right. It doesn't always have to be failure. It could be right. difficulty. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's also interesting. MCDM's RPG, I think you guys talked about it, doesn't have an attack roll, right? right. You, you always hit. It's just how much you do. And right. so that's an example of like kind of steering things a little differently to just not have the dud. Right. Yeah. But to, then you always have to contend true. with the players. You have to contend with the players who, if the game play is you always hit, then they're disappointed that. Oh, yeah, I only did low. I right. only did twelve points of damage when I could have sure. done eighty. But I still get that in five E, right? Like, oh, I hit. Yeah. Oh, I rolled a one. Right. <laughs> I rolled a one on my damage. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and so you're always going to have to deal with, as Mike has said, individual players and what their disappointment level or what their right. what, what their definition of disappointment yeah. is. And you might have uh, to see it. You can ask them, but they might uh -huh. not tell you the truth. You have to watch yeah. it happen, right? And, and Pe see people it. lie, Mike. Have you ever noticed? Well, or they not. <laughs> they it, you know, it's not just they lie. They just don't describe themselves accurately. Right. Not because they're hiding it, but just they don't. Right. They don't understand. It. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So our next question comes via Alien Shadow uh, on Twitter saying, generally speaking, DMs, if you feel the party needs a boost, do you A, run a DM PC or two, give the PCs feats, boons, sidekicks, which they control, potions, mag magic items, etc. Or three, something else entirely. And uh, so for this question, as per usual, I avoid the question completely and ask a question back, which right. is if you're the DM, why does your party need a boost? Yeah. What, what you does could, that mean? You right. control the challenge. Right. Uh, if something is obviously too much for them, it is in your control to change the situation, to reduce the challenge, present the challenge in a new way. Um, yep. You don't ever have to even worry about their capabilities if you control this end of the equation. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I wanted to hear So I was thoughts. just going to say, there are some times where you might be completely lacking in a specific thing, that even as you're changing the challenges, for example, having a group that doesn't have any sort of ability to hit more than one monster at a time is going to be hard mm -hmm. for those times where you have to fight lots of monsters. Or if you don't have any way to heal, right? Like the, the common one is, do we have a healer? Like if you don't mm -hmm. have a healer, is that going to be trouble if anybody drops or if people need healing? So there are times where there's like a, a hole in a configuration of, of character abilities. Or even like, we don't have anybody that's good at talking, right? All, all of us, we all took charisma as our dump stat mm -hmm. and none of us are good at talking. Do you need some way to, you know, like, you know, it, it, that even that can be hard to deal with if you were planning on running a game where you're gonna have characters talking. So there's there are certain times where there's a hole in the, can, yeah. you know, in the, in the complement of characters that, that might be harder to fix than just sort of shifting the challenge around a little bit. Yep. Now, if there is a, as Mike just said, if there is a reason why you do need to give the party a boost, if, if you need to give them something, my, my rules for my own preferences are never run a DMPC unless it's absolutely necessary. Yeah, um, I, agree with that. I, I have enough. I don't, I don't know when time. it is in, I don't know yeah. when it is absolutely necessary. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I, I've tried, I, I've tried I haven't to, run I've tried one in think. 20 years. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so. Yeah, I don't do that. If you can make that work for your group, great. But I avoid it uh, for a lot of different reasons. I also try to fiddle with the characters as little as possible. Uh, 
especially giving them things that change their character. Here, here, take two extra feats. Here, take yeah. this boon. The game was, you, know, you can change the game any way you want for your group. But the game was built with certain expectations in mind. So to go off and to really change the characters can work for you in that instance, but then it becomes a problem down the road. Yeah. Giving magic items is much easier. As Mike yeah. said, if you have no healing, oh, guess what? You find yeah. scrolls of cure wounds or potions of cure yeah. wounds or whatever it is yeah. that you that need. Ring, the ring that lets you cast a healing word once a day. Exactly. Just to get the just just to get the the you know, barbarian up when he falls. You get your fighter back off of, up on their feet. Yeah. Exactly. And then if if there is a reason, especially a story reason, to have NPCs travel with the party. I like to make a stat block and hand it to the players and say, somebody run this this uh, NPC, there's the stat block. Even if it's something that later I'm going to need to take back as the DM to run it as a monster or at, you know in some other way, just get it out of my hands. Let the players do it. They're, it's their story uh, along with your guidance. So let them tell the story in their own way. Yeah. Uh, do you have yeah, any I, similar I, rules? Yeah, so uh, in, in particular, one-on-one -on -one games that I've run and love, uh, in one-on-one -on -one games, the thing that I have found personally that works best is to give the player a sidekick that's clearly not their main... They have a main character, and then they have a sidekick character. They control the sidekick character from a mechanical standpoint, mm -hmm. but the GM can role-play the sidekick. Mm -hmm. And I, I, if you're going to do a GM pc like that's sort of a half gm pc but really yeah. it's an npc <laughs> that's running you know whose right. mechanics are with the character but the nice thing about that is in a one-on-one -on -one game that definitely gives you know like it's really hard to run D, &D with just a single character uh mm -hmm. two characters can is that de is definitely doable and um and then you can give the mechanics of that character to the player that that worked really well for me when i've run one-on-one -on -one games a few times mm -hmm. excellent and the final question comes from Talos the Stormlord via our Patreon Discord. And we did this one right. Yeah, there has been some great conversation around this topic on uh, on this on this topic and many topics on our Discord. But this one, uh, Talos sums up with this question for us. We are discussing the D&D 5e meta plot with the obelisks that may culminate in the Vecna adventure in 2024. It seems like Wizards of the Coast wanted to have an underlying story advancing in 5e, revealing the mystery of the obelisks and what they're for. But it seems like either they didn't fully commit or didn't fully plan it out because it's not been consistently building. For example, the Shattered Obelisk Adventure told us nothing new despite being named for <laughs> the Metaplot's MacGuffin. So it got us wondering, one, what are examples of good meta plots that run across other D&D adventure series, whole editions, or other products? Uh, someone mentioned Traveler's Imperial Rebellion story arc. And two, perhaps most importantly, what does that tell us about making a good meta plot? And I'm going to start with examples, uh, even though I want to start the other way. But I'll start with examples. For me, the the ultimate meta plot uh was the Marvel Cinematic Universe. When you watched Iron Man and you sit there and those of you who sat through the credits would then say, wait, there's more. And it has, right, has, has Samuel L. Jackson come up. Now, I knew nothing about comic books. So I hear all my friends going, did you see what the, after the, the trailer, after the credits and, and talking to each other about how cool it was? And I had no idea who Nick Fury was. I had no idea what S.H.I.E.L.D. was. Uh, so I'm like, yeah, dude, Aunt Samuel L. Jackson just showed up and said something about Avenger something. And they're like, no, oh, man, don't you get it? I'm like, no, I, I, I don't get it. But that's an example of a meta plot done right because they are or at least done better yeah. because they're yeah. planning years and years into the future. Well, they, and they have there's, like, wasn't wasn't there an end scene where it's like Agent Coulson is like, yeah, we found something weird and it's Mjolnir. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, oh, Thor's coming. A like, exactly. Oh, oh. So. <laughs> So in to see Samuel Jackson as Nick Fury. Something else is he freaking Thor. <laughs> this is true. So that's done right. Uh, or at least that's done in a way that it reveals this meta plot um, right. in a way that's exciting and fun and people who are into it are really, really into it. I was having trouble thinking of RPG meta plots. So I had to go there, all the way back. There have been some. 
Yeah, I, I'm sure there have. I just, nothing popped into my head. So against yeah. the Giants, right, those mm -hmm. AD&D adventures, you start off in the studying of the Hell Giant Chief. And then there are clues that say, oh, but there's also this, you know, these giants are getting together and talking. So maybe there are more giants somewhere. And that leads you to the glacial rift of the frost giant, Jarl. And then there's like, oh, but there's other giants and they're doing things. OK, that leads you to the Hall of the Fire Giant King. And at the end of that adventure, you see these strange dark skinned elves. And you're like, hmm, I don't know what these elves are. What's going on? And that's where the drow come in, which leads you to descent into the depths of the earth and then the shrine of Kuotoa and then vault of the drow and then all the way to queen of demon web pits. So there is that larger meta plot there. Uh, did you have other ones that you were I have, thinking? Of? I have three, and you're okay. not going to like them. I'm sure I don't. The time of troubles. Okay. Yeah. The the sundering. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the yeah. second sundering. Okay. <laughs> like you know, I don't know if it was a second sundering. I saw it on the wiki. It was um, the re the re unsundering. <laughs> the re, the unsundering, right? And and this actually, you know, if I'm gonna uh, if I'll have a hot take on this. This is one of those good examples where I don't think RPGs are better served than other fictional events mm -hmm. because they don't involve the characters and the characters yeah. are what really matter. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons why I think like this, the spell plague was both like a, a story element built on a marketing philosophy, mm -hmm. right? Of like, oh, let's, we're going to move the whole Forgotten Realms forward a hundred years so that people won't feel like they are lost in the storyline and we can kind of do a big reset but we'll also have a big event and we'll have all these writers write for it and we'll have the spell plague and I, I still couldn't explain to you what the hell the spell plague was right like i you know it doesn't make and most people are like man i just wanted the forgotten realms to run in and i remember when i was like 14 and i remember reading the books that were based on the time of troubles and i was like i don't want this i just want my characters to be doing things in the realms yeah. The idea that there's these other characters who are kind of gods walking around doing god stuff and the whole world is changing from book A to book C. Now I've got to account for all of these changes in my own home game and I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't want these big changes. So I feel like you know, you could have sort of a meta event like the last war in Eberron, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Where it happened already. It's already done. It's already part of the event. It's not an ongoing meta plot. It's just you know, an event that occurred in the past that you can use to kind of drive your characters and your stories and your plots forward anyway. And then you can build your own meta plots in your own campaigns that mm -hmm. are directly tied to the characters that are in the game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's where I, I, I think it breaks down. And it's like, if we hung on too tightly to the obelisk stuff, then that could overtake the elements of the story of our, of our games that our players are actually part of. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. now I think it's different in organized play, like organized mm -hmm. play meta events could right. be very important for being the cohesive nature. I remember like each season of the like I didn't really get involved in organized play until until 5e, mm -hmm. I guess four and I did some 4e stuff a 4e and 5e. And but I remember that like when they were doing sort of the Adventures League seasonal stuff, there were sort of meta events that were built around those seasonal mm -hmm. campaigns. And then right. the adventures you ran were sort of tied to them. Yeah. Um, and that, that can work a little better because you recognize that I'm just one character of thousands that are in the world right now while all of this is going on. Yeah. Um, but in a home game, like it seems so much better to build your own big meta events that involve the characters directly instead of having like, you know, like, mm -hmm. ridiculous. And instead of having Wizards of the Coast <laughs> dictate one to you, right? right? Like make your own. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. No, no. And, and it can be, it could be fun to say, the multiverse spanning threat now is blank and look how it affects Eberron. Look at how it affects the Forgotten Realms. Look at how it affects. And and so you could you could bring your characters into it that way as as long as what you're saying, Mike, is true, is that it's your characters in your game that are doing the thing, <laughs> not someone else. I don't I don't think we need a spell plague that affects all game worlds. No. <laughs> right? like, yeah, I, I don't, don't mean don't I don't mean that on. I don't mean that changes the world. I right. mean, yeah, you know, for these the, the next adventure for each of these worlds is going to take into account this thing. So the threat is going to be yeah. this. Not that the whole world changes, not that you can't run your home games now, but right, just right. you know, th this sort of thing. But I, you know, what we're getting at is at least for me, is that meta plots are actually easy. 
right? Because all metaplots are, are plots that are spread over the course of several items rather than just within one item. At least to me, that's what a metaplot is. What's difficult is making them stand out in a way that reveals slowly, has an impact. So when when the threads of the metaplot are introduced, they introduce curiosity into the game. Hmm, what's this? Or, ooh, does this mean something? And then have that actually play out over several uh, several pieces of media, whether it's books, movies, TV shows, RPGs, whatever. Uh, easy to want to do, very, very hard to do well. Right. In, in a way that is pleasing to everyone. Yeah, uh, yeah. So right. you just have to think ahead. If you're doing it for your home games, think ahead. Think about what the final, what you plan the final thing to be and start leaving seeds. They don't have to be too overt. You can start with some small clues that will then lead up to larger things later. Right. With that in mind, we are now going to switch over to our news and commentary section. Starting with some sad news, we are remembering Janelle Jaquies. Uh, on January 10th, the industry lost uh, Janelle. She was an incredible contributor to the RPG community, not just in tabletop games, but also in video games. Uh, she was the author of some of the first adventures ever sold for role-playing games, such as Dark Tower, Caverns of Thracia, Griffin Mountain, and many other adventures that were then used as a template for not just DMs, but for other game designers to create their own uh, stuff over the years. The fifth Forgotten Realm supplement, The Savage North, was a work of Janelle's. She was also an artist all the way back to the classic first edition AD&D hardbacks, uh, to Dragon Magazine covers, second edition work uh, book covers and art. Impressive, whether they were black and white drawings or full color covers. She also did uh, miniature concepting and sculpting work. Uh, what do you remember, uh, Janelle, for in your gaming life? Yeah, so I'm 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 not familiar. I have seen some of her older older works, but I had not really dug into it. And what first brought her name to my attention was Justin Alexander on the Alexandrian, mm -hmm. uh, digging into her particular designs for dungeon maps, which he originally called Jayquay's style dungeon yep. design. Yeah, so I, I really only, uh, you know, became aware of, of her work from those articles and particularly for asymmetric dungeon design. The idea mm -hmm. of having, you know, building engaging dungeons. We were talking about upward beats and downward beats before and how that works. And the idea of like the, how the physical design of a dungeon can support those kind of beats. The idea of giving players the opportunity for discovery, for learning mm -hmm. things, for hacking things. That idea of like... You know, you have your, I always thought of like the, the simplest Jayquay's style dungeon is two rooms with a main hall and a secret hall, right? And mm -hmm. it's like, you know, when the players get to discover the secret hall, they feel like they got a leg up on somebody, right? Right. And I think we see that in other dungeons, like Dyson from Dyson's Logos uses a lot of dungeon design like that. Um, and, you know, we've seen, I've, I've seen this in many, you know, different, different D&D designs. Um, and yeah, so I, I really became aware of it from that and then looked back over some over her, her older work. I actually want to pick up the Savage North Guide because I've heard mm -hmm. wonderful things about it. Um, uh, 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 Gnome Stew just had a really good article uh, looking back at a lot of her work that, that I had read. So, yeah, very, very sad, very, very sad to, to, to have lost her for this community. Yeah. Uh, if you want to read others, as Mike said, there are some articles out there, including Shin and Apple Klein, uh, RPG historian, uh, has a great article on uh, designersanddragons.com about uh, what Janelle has done for the industry. And you can also help by donating to uh, cover medical costs that her widow is uh, enduring. There's a GoFundMe for uh, Janelle Jaquies. So uh, you can check that out. And thanks, uh, Janelle, for everything you've done for the industry. We have news from Evil Hat on the business side of things. Evil Hat shared their quarter four 2023 numbers. Um, they do so every quarter, which is yeah, very informative for 
we in the industry who keep track of such things. And Mike and I have, before the show started, looked at a little bit of data. And Mike even did the due diligence of reaching out to get even more answers. Uh, so looking at these numbers, Mike, what, uh, what, what were some of your thoughts? So, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, this is, you know, there's a whole other side to this hobby and particularly for me as a, as a, you know, independent publisher, I'm always fascinated with like, Oh, thank God. Giant spreadsheets. Oh, big spreadsheets <laughs> full of numbers that I could dive into and do pivoting on and do analysis and comparisons and all kinds of stuff, because it's very interesting to see like, how are other people getting along, uh, getting along in the industry? I did have a bunch of questions and like you and I were talking about, it, and I was like, is that blades in the dark, right? Like 68,000 copies of blades in the dark. Is that all of them? Does that include Amazon copies? Does that include other copies? And I was like, I don't really know. So I reached out to, uh, uh, uh to, uh, Fred from evil hat and, mm -hmm. and asked him like some questions on that. And it turns out there was some interesting things like, uh, that they don't have the digital rights to Blades in the Dark on other platforms, so it doesn't include things like drive-through RPG sales, right? So you, taking mm -hmm. the numbers with a grain of salt is is pretty interesting. But then you say like, well, what does it all mean? And I'm like, I don't know. Let me ask him. So you know, and and in my conversation with him right before the show, uh, he was like, yeah, you can ask me. You know, we, 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 he very much wants to be an open book about what the business is like. And I was like, well, so how's it going? Right. Like, you know, of all the we can dive into the numbers and all that stuff. But the big question is like, how how does he feel about it? And his answer is he feels good. Right. He feels mm -hmm. good about the numbers that he saw. He said that this was really that this is something he brought up. I asked him if I had his permission to talk about this on the show because it was like, well, you know, whenever anybody starts talking about like numbers and dollars, I'm like, well, I'm not talking about it, but you can talk about it. And so I wanted to be sure. And one of the things he said is that 2023 was their biggest gross revenue year, uh, which was about two million dollars. That was a mix of. Um, web store sales, distribution sales, and crowdfunding uh, that in, in fairness is not adjusted for inflation. So like mm -hmm. that $2 million being high. And, and then he said they spent 94% of that in 2023 so that the total profit on $2 million is about a hundred thousand. And I was like, Oh, like, like that is a huge, <laughs> right? Like, man, that's a big, you know, yeah. That's a high percentage. But then you're like, well, if you really are taking the money that you're getting from all these and investing them in the other books and investing them in stuff. And, and, and I think mm -hmm. you asked, you brought up, well, what about staff? And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. that's a good point. Cause like, I don't have a staff. It's me and my wife. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, so for us, like we don't take a salary. It's all, anything that comes in comes right to us. And he does, he, he basically, he doesn't, he is the only other full timer mm -hmm. and everybody else is contract support and none of them are full time. Uh, and he has about one, two, three, four, about five, it looks like five other people working part time on uh, different different aspects of the business. And they're the money that he's paying them for that work is also coming out of that, um, you know, coming out of the money that they're earning. So well, then as soon as you say, OK, you've got staff on board, you can understand why, mm -hmm. you know, total profit margin is only one hundred thousand dollars on a two million dollar uh, gross you know, gross amount. So that, that, you know, that to me is a fascinating thing, but really the big question is that you want to ask that I ask is like, how do people feel about it? Right. Are you, mm -hmm. are you happy with how things went? And, you know, I guess we use some of this as sort of a benchmark of the industry and mm -hmm. where things are going, but I, I don't know how much you can use that uh, as a good benchmark, but I mean, you could kind of say, Hey, you know, all independent publishers of RPG products, whether you are selling a few products on the DMs Guild that you made yourself or whether you actually are doing things like warehousing and offset printing and or whether you have a staff like like Matt Colville with a whole company. How do you feel about how the industry has done is probably a pretty useful question to ask. Yeah. And then how, you know, checking it year to year. Um, right. That that to me is kind of a, a real a fascinating and interesting question. And I don't know that there's a good answer to it you know like i made a joke with somebody on a with, we were on a discord server with a bunch of other T ttrpg marketing folks and i brought up a thing and i was like you know they were bringing up like the ai art controversies that have been going on recently and i said did you see a sales drop because of the ai art controversy and they're like no that'd be ridiculous i'm like so why are we worried <laughs> like yeah. like whatever the controversy is like i think it takes order of magnitude problems before we actually start to see it directly and that's, you know, that that's something that I, I, I try to keep in mind. Like Fred, as another independent publisher, I'm also happy. Like my, my mm -hmm. last year was 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 fine. I think it wasn't as good as the year I had during COVID. Right. Mm -hmm. I probably had 20 percent overall drop from from where COVID is. But so did the whole rest of the world. Right. <laughs> you know, so did all of retail. And 
a 20% drop for me is not like, oh my God, I went from in the black to in the red, right? right? It, it's like, no, it, it was fine. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with things where things are going. But I also have lots of other support mechanisms in my life that mm -hmm. make that okay, right? Yeah. Where like I can weather stuff like that. But uh, yeah. yeah, so it's it, it was really fascinating and good on Fred for really putting all of his, you know, putting everything out there and letting people dive into the business. It's very yeah. rare. I don't know. I don't really know anybody. There's only a couple of other companies I know of that that do that and um and it's really fascinating to see yeah uh I, matthew sprang um or sprange uh, uh i can't remember the name of the company that he that he does they do um they did like the babylon 5 role-playing game mm. um he does like a state oh mongoose publishing that's it he does a state of the mongoose thing every year he doesn't drill down into to these numbers i mean i'm looking at the spreadsheet for what is it over 330 products between fiction, yeah. nonfiction, board games, virtual tabletop accessories, yeah. role playing yeah. games, and it's, it's you know what were sales last quarter, what were sales this quarter, what's the lifetime right. sales, uh, right. so this is this is some uh, this is some in depth data, and I'm glad you reached out to Fred uh, Fred Hicks because you know knowing that they did two thousand or two million dollars in revenue, if you had asked me how how much revenue did uh, did a uh, evil hat, hat yeah. make this year if you had told me two million i would have said that's low that's got to be low mm -hmm. but that's the most that's the highest he said right that's the highest mm -hmm. revenue that they've ever had uh, yeah and you think uh you know one kickstarter could be four million dollars yeah <laughs> uh it just it shows the the range of what this industry is and what it could be because mm -hmm. uh, this this is that's that's two million dollars of revenue off of 300 products um yeah right which shows well, the the, right. the long tail of, yeah three, right. 300 individuals you know skews right like individual, exactly yeah individual yeah. things yeah it is there's some i was just i hadn't really dug into this but it is also very interesting to see like his vtt sales right, right? he's got a whole section of just stuff he vtts and it sells hardly anything yeah. There's some cases you see like the Monster of the Week core books sold some. I also wonder if these were like the VTTs were bundled in with other sort of right. products. And, and that's why like you see 0000, you know, 300. And it's like, wow, you know, did Monster of the Week just do really well as a core book on VTTs? Or was it because that was included in some kind of other package? Mm -hmm. You know, saying Girl by Moon Knight, I, I, Moonlight, which I don't I don't actually know what that is, had a thousand you know, a thousand VTT sales. I, I got to believe that that was bundled in yeah. with, with something else. But that's really interesting to see because there is one of the things that's interesting is there, and, and particularly for people who aren't publishers but are pressuring publishers, there's a lot of times where they're pressuring publishers saying like, I can't believe you don't have a foundry module for right. product X. And you're like, yeah. it's going to cost me a lot of money and no one's going to buy it, right? Yeah. Or you, know, yeah. you, you'll buy it and like three of your friends and no one else will do it and I'll never make my money back. Yeah. And, you know, I've done experiments like that. We did, you know, we did an experiment for, for Fantastic Layers where we're like, oh, let's put Fantastic Layers up on Roll20. Mm -hmm. And it makes hardly anything, right? Like, right. It, it, you know, it, 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 it you know, it, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. It was an mm -hmm. experiment that didn't work. And so that there's definitely times where people think that something would be a good idea. Right. And data like this helps you see, ah, uh, no, that's not how yeah. that's going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, same with translations, right? You get requests yeah. for, please oh, translate translate this into yeah. German. Yeah. You know, right. my friends and I all want it. Well, right. right. That's there's four copies sold. Yeah, uh, I have I have one translation that I did of Return in Italian, mm -hmm. and I you know every so often I get a check, right? Mm -hmm. Every so often they send me some money for it, and the only nice thought there was I didn't pay for it. Right. <laughs> they, 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 I yeah. didn't I didn't have to pay for the translation. They just get right. a bigger percentage of the total, and that's that that worked out. But but yeah, yeah. that's one of the issues. And my 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 sort of counteraction for that is try to release as much as I can under an open license that lets people translate it if they want to. Mm -hmm. And so I have a lazy GM resource guide available under a creative commons license. And now there are, it's in Japanese mm -hmm. and it's, you know, it's in a whole bunch of languages that like it would have taken me forever to do mm -hmm. that. And people don't understand how hard that is, like how hard oh yeah, you know, doing a quality translation job really is. It's really tough. So yeah, mm -hmm. I get that all the time too though. So that that was an interesting thing. We have a link in the show notes to all of that information, which is in uh, Google Doc. In our crowdfunding news, we have 
uh, creator and crowdfunding news, we have Andy Demps, who did a blog as a follow-up about the conversation that we had both on Mastering Dungeons and the Elder Troller cast about the stun condition. Um, and Andy gives examples from his actual play at conventions over the years about how it's worked and what people's reactions have been to it. So if you want to check that out, please do so. Um, have you been following along in any of those conversations, Mike? No, I mean, I'm just skim reading the article now. And I would start having not read the article, so thus I might be convinced I'm not a fan of the stunt condition. Yeah. <laughs> right? I, don't, I think it's a big nope. So I don't, right. yeah, you know, it'll be interesting. Like, I'm going to read this article, and will the article change my mind on the stunt condition? <laughs> well, it, it, it goes back, it sort of goes back to the first question we answered, which is about players, right? Yeah. Some players do that, stunned is a real downbeat for a character. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and how people react to it will depend on the player. It'll depend on the game. I mean, we're talking about stunned in terms of 5th edition D&D and what that means, which is, hey, you, you can't do anything this round. Uh, right. So yeah. Taking agency away is always a real rough area. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we wanted to also mention that Roll20 has both Blade Runner and Planescape in formats that are very nice, very easy to run. Uh, Teos wanted to talk about this, but he's not here, so here I go. Uh, in uh, in some of the newer Roll20 titles, they now have pages that provide overviews of the functionality to help you get the game up and running faster. So for Planescape, we get tokens for all the monsters, many of the NPC and even PC tokens, maps for all the major scenes with the tokens already set up or hidden, depending on where they are uh, in, expected to be shown in the adventure. The maps use all the features, including lighting, doors, and so forth. We get the Sigil uh, and Outlands poster maps so that they can be shared with the players. A full compendium of all three books with the adventure broken into pieces, including those handouts. Teos says overall it's a great implementation. He uh, looks amazing, it works really well, and he recommends. And there's also a Blade Runner starter set on Roll20 for $30, uh, coming with handouts, visuals, the map of Los Angeles, the encounter maps, everything that we'd started talking about last week. They also have the capabilities for the initiative cards and other cards showing off art, dealing with the chase uh, mechanic, chase maneuvers and obstacles. It takes into account criticals. So when you roll, it has glowing character sheets for for those critical hits uh, so teos recommends that as well and in fact the second part of this episode teos will be here talking about the adventure that was included with the uh with the starter set and i got one more thing to talk about in uh crowdfunding news i want you to get ready for surviving strange hollow this is a kickstarter that is coming uh, late winter early spring published by accidental cyclops who did a kickstarter for an rpg called the real thing that was based on the music of faith no more strange surviving strange hollow will be a 5e setting based on the artwork of the talented and visionary artist emily Hare. if you type emily Hare and do a search you will see her art and you probably will recognize it i'm sure you've seen it somewhere if you're a fantasy fan it's otherworldly and cute but spooky and goofy with that deadliness uh, lurking underneath. I mention this because I'm going to be the lead designer on this project. The first team we've put together are Ed Greenwood, Lisa Teague, uh, James Hake, Dale Kingsmill, Brian C.P. Steele, and Aaron Roberts. We're going to be doing the setting side of things with this team creating the narratives, uh, creating the backstory, creating some of the areas that you will be adventuring in. Then we're going to name some more creators when we get to the mechanics side of things. And we're going to tailor those mechanics based on this world. So it's gonna be a world first and then 5e mechanics to follow that up. Uh, I'll talk about it more on the show later, but you can go right now to accidentalcyclops.com and sign up to be notified with more information about uh, this Kickstarter when it comes out and some previews that we will be giving along the way. So if you could check that out, I appreciate it. Mike, 
thank you so much for coming on to the show, talking about the news and giving your uh, take on some of these questions. I am always happy to do it. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. And now more with Teos and I on the adventure in the Blade Runner starter set.